Okay, so just as a brief overview, I'm gonna, tonight I'm gonna give a brief overview of the health effects of ambient air pollution and air toxics. This is in no way meant to be a comprehensive a review of the health effects because there are volumes and volumes of literature out there. So this is really meant to be a brief overview and it's not specific to rail yards or diesel trucks, it's really just an overview of the health effects of ambient air pollution and air toxics. And I am going to go fast through this but I'll be around for the question and answer period and you're welcome to contact me later as well. So in the U.S., ambient air pollution or outdoor air pollution is regulated by the U.S. EPA. And the EPA regulates uh, major classes of pollutants, including the hazardous air pollutants or air toxics, of which there are about 187 chemicals in this group. They also regulate the six criteria air pollutants, and I'm going to go through those as well. So I'll start just briefly describing the air toxics. This is a group of chemicals, as I said before, about 187 chemicals. These are pollutants that, um, according to the EPA, that are known or suspected to cause cancer or other serious health effects. So that's a pretty broad definition. It includes a wide variety and classes of chemicals. Um, some examples that you may have heard of include things like benzene, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, uh, formaldehydes, different types of aldehydes, um, and things like 1,3-butadiene, which is uh, um, in, in diesel particles. Um, other things are such as um, perchloroethylene, which is common to uh, dry cleaner chemicals, um, and then some heavy medical metals such as arsenic and, and mercury. Uh, a lot of the air toxics come from similar sources. Um, the major sources include fuel combustion, such as diesel and gasoline combustion. Uh, they arise from different industrial processes, um, including oil refineries um, and smelters. Now, the, the other class of pollutants that are regulated by the EPA are called the criteria pollutants. And these are the six pollutants um, that are regulated in, in the, by the EPA, and they set standards for these pollutants. These include sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, which includes NO, NO2, and NOx, if you hear any of those tonight, uh, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, which is a big one that we'll talk about, um, ozone, which I'm sure you've heard about here in the, the summertime, um, as well as lead. I'm not going to concentrate on lead today. It's not that important anymore in the ambient air. Um, there are two major classes of these pollutants. There are primary pollutants, which are directly emitted from, from sources, um, and then there are secondary pollutants. And the secondary pollutants are, are parts of particulate matter. Um, as well as ozone. So these are pollutants that are not emitted by anything, but they're formed by secondary reactions in the atmosphere. So just a little bit more about ozone. Um, as I just said, ozone is a secondary pollutant. It's formed in the atmosphere. The, the necessary compounds that are needed in order to make ozone in the atmosphere include volatile organic um, compounds, or VOCs, which are a byproduct of combustion processes, including fuel combustion. Um, there are also uh, other sources include things like solvents or paints around the house can also emit uh, VOCs. The other necessary component are the nitrogen oxides, and nitrogen oxides are emitted from, again, from combustion sources. They're emitted from diesel and gasoline automobiles, as well as from stationary sources. So when you have these two components in the atmosphere and in the presence of UV radiation or sunlight, um, they, they combine to create ozone. And this is why you see high levels of ozone during the summertime when we have sunny, hot days. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about particulate matter. Um, it's, it's one of the major um, ambient air pollutants that we're concerned about in terms of the health effects. Particulate matter is not just one thing. It's a mixture of different solids and liquids and different chemicals. Um, it has some natural sources. It, um, the primary sources in the U.S. are from the man-made sources, including things like industrial processes, fuel combustion. There are also sources, especially for the, for the larger particles, um, things like fugitive road dust, um, which is just resuspended road dust when you have a lot of traffic. Uh, other sources include things like mining and agricultural activities. So when we talk about particulate matter, we talk about not only the different chemical speciation of particulate matter, but we're also very interested in the size fraction of particulate matter. 
So the particulate matter that we're, we're concerned about are the very smallest particles. Uh, these, this is what we call PM10. They're, they're particles less than 10 micrometers in diameter. So we're concerned about these particles because that is a side fr size fraction that can be inhaled into our lungs. And that's why we're concerned about that. So these are all microscopic. microscopic. We can't see these particles in the size range. And then even within the, the, that size range of PM10, we, are, we divide that into different size fractions. Um, and, and we can talk about those different size fractions in terms of their health effects. So the larger fraction is the coarse particulate matter. That's um, particles that are 2.5 to 10 micrometers. The smaller particles are what we call the fine particulate matter. These are 2.5 micrometers and smaller. And then we also have this very sm small size fraction at the bottom there that we call the ultrafine particles, um, abbreviated as UFP. So these are the, s the very smallest particles. Um, they're less than 100 nanometers in diameter. Primarily, over the, the past 10, 15 years, we have been mostly concerned in terms of health effects with the smallest particles, the fine particulate matter. However, more recently, the EPA is interested in, in, in looking, doing more research with the coarse fraction as well, because there are, there are still lingering concerns about the, the coarse fraction as well. So this is a busy slide that I'm going to have to run through for, for the sake of time. Uh, this really demonstrates uh, the, the various health effects that have been observed in relation to ambient air pollutants. So on the left side, we have the respiratory health effects. And these are the most intuitive. This is what most people would think of. Um, it's natural to think of if we're inhaling something into our lungs that we're going to affect the lungs themselves. And, and this we do see this. Um, we see increased um, incidence of uh, coughing and wheezing, uh, reduced lung function in relation to increased air pollution levels. There's evidence of reduced resistance to respiratory infection with increased air pollution levels, as well as exacerbation or um, just making the, uh, your asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease worse. Uh, there's also evidence for an association of um, increased risk of lung cancer as in respiratory mortality in relation to increased air pollution levels. So those are the major respiratory health effects. Those are pretty well known. They've been studied for about the last 20 or 30 years or so. More recently, we've expanded this diagram to include other areas of health effects that, that have been observed in relation to increased air pollution levels. There is some evidence of, of reproductive effects, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later on. Um, more recently, there's been a lot of emphasis on the cardiovascular health effects. And this is something that wasn't studied 20 or 30 years ago. And I'll talk a little bit about how we think this happens because it's not as intuitive to how a, a particle inhaled into your lungs can actually affect the cardiovascular system. And even more recently, there's growing interest on the effects on the central nervous system. There's not as much evidence here, but there is some evidence and it's a growing area of research. So when we talk about the health effects of, of air pollution, we think of the health effects either as short-term health effects, meaning does the air pollution from a few days ago affect my health today? And we can also then think of the long-term health effects. So does living in a, a highly polluted city for the for 20 or 30 years of my life affect my long-term health consequences? So this slide is showing one of the classic studies looking at the long-term health effects. This is a Harvard six City study, and it was um, a very simple idea, just looking at six, six different cities in the U.S. with varying levels of air pollution. And what this study showed, and it was one of the, the groundbreaking studies of its time, was that the, um, the people in the, the, the city with the highest levels of air pollution, which was Steubenville, Ohio, which was a very industrial city at the time, had a 26% higher risk of mortality compared to people living in the, the, the cleaner city, which was Portage, Wisconsin. So what this translated to on a population level was a shortened life expectancy of about one to two years. So it took about one to two years off of people's life on average if you lived in a more polluted city. When we talk about health effects of air pollution, we're always concerned about more susceptible populations. Um, one population that we think is, is highly susceptible are children. So children are susceptible, we think, um, for several reasons. One reason is that children inhale much more air per body weight than adults do. They have a higher respiratory rate and smaller lungs, so the, the net effect is that they're inhaling much more air per, per, per body weight um, compared to adults. 
children are also outside more. They're outside playing um, where the air pollution levels are sometimes higher. Uh, children are also susceptible because they, are, they have developing organ systems. So we think about their lungs can develop until the age of 18 or 21. So if they're, if they're exposed during these developmental periods, we, we're very concerned about those health effects. So one study uh, from, from the California group uh, was looking at some of these uh, long-term health effects in children. So the Children's Health